Good afternoon and welcome to this Sharing 60 from Building People. My name is Rebecca Lovelace. I am the founder and chief doctor joiner at Building People, and we are a hub for equity, diversity and inclusion in the built environment. Our mission is to improve representation across the built environment by enabling and empowering a collaborative movement for inclusive change. And one of the ways in which we do this is by amplifying the voice of our network through events such as this Sharing 60. And Sharing 60 is all about um, bringing more people together, um, enabling the sharing of online equity, diversity and inclusion guidance for the built environment shared by the Building People Network. So I'm absolutely thrilled to be able to introduce Jan Peters today, who will be talking about inclusion score and ISO 3415, um, which is diversity, equity, inclusion and belonging. Um, Jan will present, we'll have informal Q&A and we're really looking forward to both hearing Jan's expertise, but also um, gaining from that and having that opportunity to discuss that within this group. So welcome, everybody, and a huge welcome to you, Jan, and over to you. Brilliant. Thanks so much, Rebecca. It's a really a great pleasure to be here today. So my mission today is to explore how we can be more systematic about diversity and inclusion, but also to raise awareness of how ISO 40315 um, and, and the, the impact that it can have for you and your business. But I also want to introduce you to a platform that's been built around the ISO so that can help you to manage your progress on diversity and inclusion. And um, I, I hope that you've got some questions that pop up as we're going through and be delighted to have time at the end to answer them. And some of the challenges that we face today are that 78 percent of companies, uh, according to uh, Quanted.com, have got a relatively immature DE and I initiative or program in place. Disappointing, I find the fact that it's going to be 151 years before we close the global economic gender gap at all levels. And um, but the thing that should really make your ears prick up today is the impact uh, that the failing to address diversity and inclusion within your business properly exposes you to significant risk. And that is why um, Inclusion Score um, is focusing on and has really come together from the insurance sector. And what is the risk to your business? The, this uh, Duke Corporate Education shows that the risk to a business is that for um, DEI um, challenges to make to a business, um, your business will face a 3.1% loss on its market capitalization. Over the, th over the three days when a story first breaks. So it's a significant thing to consider um, around why you really need to take diversity and inclusion more seriously and thread it into the very fabric of your business. If you may have noticed um, this week that Lloyds of London is about to invest 65 million pounds following the slavery report um, and the role that Lloyds had in um, in the slave trade. Um, Lloyd's, of course, is a massive global insurance company. Um, there's an article on Reuters that you can go and Google and find, but also there's an article on in The Guardian from yesterday's newspaper about how it's um, understanding about how it can make an impact on um, changing the whole profile of, um, of, of the profession in the insurance sector. And and how we can go about doing that. But also, what is what? Do, how do insurance companies face and uh, assess the risk to your business? And um, if you look at one of the other articles that I'll be flagging up later, it, you'll see that we're um, that you're. I think it was. Um, oh, here it is. Beasley Shore, which is one of the Lloyd's companies. Um, that if you have. Um, going for your insurance renewal and you've got an increase in your maturity of your diversity and inclusion approach, then you're going to have a renewed risk to for your insurance profile. So it's really something to be taken seriously at the most senior levels in organisations. One of the biggest problems, I think, is that there's been too much emphasis on activity and not enough on outcomes. And there's lots of different examples of where um, that has been the case. 
So in the many reports that have been written about diversity and inclusion, um, is the growing size of that as a business. Um, there's uh, lots of consultancies out there, lots of people offering you help and support. But what are the things that you really need to be doing to make a difference? And how are you spending your hard earned bottom line uh, profits? How are you looking after that? Um, and how are you contributing to this growth in the sector? Projected that the current seven and a half billion pounds spent globally on diversity and inclusion initiatives is set to double in the next three years. This is data that's based on uh, the spend in, in 2020. So as, as Rebecca mentioned, I'm Jan Peters and I've been working on diversity and inclusion um, since the what 1999 when I was seconded to the Department for, Department for Trade and Industry. And in terms of the built environment, my involvement um, tracks back to 2000, which is when the Institution of Civil Engineers um, launched their first um, inclu inclusion and um, uh, um, equity to programme. And the I had a, was running a conference at the time as my in my role at the DTI, and one of the um, the, the speakers that had come over from America um, picked up the leaflet from the ICE, and we had an event there. And um, she said, oh, ice flow, is that the speed it's going to move at? Um, and when you look at the fact that we're now in 2023, so that's 23 years, um, there has indeed been progress, but it has been incredibly slow. Back in 2008, while I was president of the Women's Engineering Society, um, undertook the first uh, safety clothing campaign and did a survey looking at PPE and the um, breadth of engagement across the provision of PPE and um, all sorts of different um, sectors um, use different kinds of PPE. And the stories that uh, came out, well, if they weren't true, they were truly laughable. And that followed the next thing that was of note is the um, Equality and Human Rights Commission did a, an investigation into race discrimination in the construction sector. And the report was formed, was presented in 2009 and the Construction Leadership Diversity Forum was then formed. I then one attended to undertake what was initially um, uh, going to be called a cost benefit analysis of diversity in the construction sector. And what we found was that nobody, people were spending money on doing diversity initiatives and programmes, but nobody was looking at the, the benefits and the impact of it. And so the report became a good practice study and we pulled out case studies. Um, we interviewed, we had round tables, we um, looked across the sector to see what was being done. Um, and that is available online from EHRC and should be available on the Catalytic website. Following that report, we saw the formation of the um, leadership group for fairness, inclusion and respect, because one of the things that we flagged up in that uh, in the study was that the term diversity um, in the industry caused people to glaze over. But when we talked to people about what we were really meaning about diversity, that fundamentally it was about respecting other people for who they were, for what they brought, and, and what they could add, what value they could add to a business and the workforce. And that FOA acronym has become threaded across the whole sector. We then move on to 2015 and we see the ICE, um, I'm just picking them up as one notable example, mainly because they were the first in the sector to start doing something significant. And um, we saw them participate in the WISE 10 Steps programme. And there is a report in their first strategy and the Di disruptive diversity paper that Dawn Bonfield wrote for them. We then see progress with the um, professional bodies and uh, trade associations across the engineering construction sector and the adoption and use of the diversity and inclusion progression framework, which really saw a step up in the way that organisations were addressing diversity and inclusion. But the thing of note, which is what I want to talk to you about today, is the diversity um, and inclusion in ISO. The sector and engineering more broadly is really familiar with these international standards. So I'll just tell you a little bit more about that. And if you're thinking how was construction involved in it, uh, let me tell you and reassure you that um, a guy called Kevin Bosher, who was one of the diversity team for the Olympic um, Park development, 
was a key member of um, of the uh, development of the ISA. And I'll be sharing a link to the video from the BSI, um, which was an introduction to the ISA, that you can go watch at your leisure. Um, so why do we need a standard? Um, a number of reasons. A standard really underlines and recognises the importance of a particular topic, and it provides within it practical guidance about how you can ramp up what you're doing and move towards working at that standard. We're really familiar with um, the environmental standards around um, quality and, and control around manufacturing. And so it just makes absolute sense that within diversity and inclusion, we're creating a common language. We've got a tool and a framework that is accessible across all levels of experience. But also we've got a documented um, framework that is relevant across uh, organisations, different contexts, different locations globally, um, but also that it's relevant across sectors. And in this case, it's about maturity, about growing and moving forward and not trying to look back and criticise ourselves, but it's around moving forwards. Because I'm a firm believer, um, ever since I launched the first um, dashboard for women in science in 1999, that what gets measured gets done. There's a mantra of the European Commission for the Women in Science Unit, which has evolved over time to address much broader diversity issues. So let's have a little bit of, more of a look at the ISA, but also the journey to its creation. It's not something that was just thought up over lockdown, but for sure it was impacted a little bit by lockdown. So what's the context for it? Um, so the journey um, and the development of the ISO is built on a long um, history of knowledge and expertise globally. One of the key driving people behind it was a guy called Ephemus Henderson. And if you don't know about Ephemus, uh, go and find out who he is. And he's written a couple of books um, and he runs um, Hendy work, Henderson Works. In, in America, a great consulting company in this field. So there were six years in development, and because that's a lot of different countries that need to agree on what is the context and content of the standard. It was drafted um, with lots of different people from different sectors. There was a massive consultation process that took place, and that was done over COVID with and sometimes several meetings a week between these important panel people. And then it was finalised and it was finally adopted in the UK in February 2021. It worked alongside um, other um, British standards around employment. And um, in uh, May 2023, it now replaces BS 76005. Um, and um, so this is now the framework that you should be using when you're looking at um, employment and your whole organisational approach to diversity and inclusion. Now you'll, re you'll remember that at the very beginning I said that a lot of diversity initiatives have been too action focused, that we've been really busy doing things. We have programmes, we have initiatives, but we're not necessarily very good at um, measuring outcomes. And so this um, framework model here provides the sort of background context to, to the ISO. And when we look at some of the elements within it, you will be able to, to recognise. We've got governance, we've got leadership, we've got designated responsibilities, human resource life cycle. And it's human resource life cycle is really a significant part of the ISO. But it looks at the inclusive culture, it looks at policies and procedures, and it also looks at our stakeholders. Um, and importantly, the products and services that we're delivering within our business. So again, I refer you back to, um, to the um, brilliant BSI website, and I know that uh, Rebecca's going to be sending you a copy of my slides out in a PDF, along with a couple of importantly, important and useful links. So one of the challenges is about how do we get knowledge and information about the standard out there? Because if people aren't adopting the standard across the whole of an industry, then we have to ask ourselves, is it really a standard? And I don't know if you could just pop, pop, in, pop into the chat. Do, does anybody know, is everybody aware of the standard? 
I'm hoping everybody's going to go yes, 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 yes. So either just put a thumbs up with your reactions or just type yes into the chat if you're aware of ISO 40315. So yes, 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 brilliant, thank you, um, which is really reassuring to me. So the um, inclusion score isn't, isn't necessarily the uh, only um, online tool that you can use to help you with the, the framework. You can go and download the ISO. Um, I think it's £260 from the BSI. And um, so feel free to, to go and um, access that. Um, but, but actually, when you're managing such a large framework, having an online tool with a project management um, um, bit, bit, bit embedded within it um, makes it suddenly much more usable by everybody within your organisation. You're able to um, use the tool within inside the SAS um, app to, to um, assign tasks to people and, and monitor progress and collect documentation. Suddenly it's in one place. You're not having to pull things together to do your reporting. So how do you use it? So there you can, as mentioned, you can download it from BSI, it's £260. Or if you're a, um, a member of the BSI, it's food, you get 50% off. So the inclusion score is a web-based SAS tool with full support, documentation and reporting that is mapped into set, this assignment, this action assignment system. And it's totally built around um, in the, uh, the, the ISO. And the, the kind of um, strap line that they use is the um, greater than or equal to. Diversity is greater or equal to inclusion. And um, that there are lots of different pillars and frameworks within it. And I'll just give you some insights into that. So this is constituted from the, the uh, um, perspective of how, what is the risk to your organisation that you need to consider and you need to in future be able to report on to your insurance broker when particularly when you're going forward for your your renewal there are 32 identified risk domains um, across diversity and inclusion that you need to be addressing as an organization and therefore you intentionally need to build these into your business processes and we'll see that the um, inclusion score has adopted a maturity framework to help you assess where you are just at three simple levels of action. Talk so uh, about those a little bit more in uh, later. So there's 32 risk domains. There are 27 types of diversity that are captured within the uh, ISO. Um, and those need to be acknowledged for each of those 32 risk domains. And that is when you start looking at the difference. So I've put them into this lovely wholesome apple here. Um, you know, it goes all the way from neurodiversity, gender, marital status, looks at geographic location. You know, that starts looking at how we can be biased against somebody because of their regional accent, let alone working um, in a different um, in a different country to someone else and having preconceptions of how they are and how our systems and processes might exclude them. Um, but it's, it covers all the other sort of, uh, not just the UK's protected characteristics, but that whole kind of sphere of difference. And that is, aside from that diversity within the fact that there are 8 billion, nearly 8 billion different people on the planet. Um, and these are things that, uh, these characteristics appear um, both in um, legal cases around diversity and inclusion, but also in terms of the frameworks, the policies and processes within the way that an organisation recruits, retains and supports its um, employees, but also how they might end up leaving. So there are four types of projects that um, have been identified in the ISO that um, can characterise how you go about tackling your ED&I e, um, e, um, programme. Um, there are um, training activities you might get engaged in, data extraction activities, internal infrastructure, but also your external infrastructure. So I've just pulled out a couple of example questions and a couple of the sort of subdomains for you to have a, a look at, and then we can maybe have a little bit more of a, a Q&A. So just as an example of a question that you uh, might uh, that you would phrase when you look at the standard. Um, so in the governance category, 
And you'll remember that in the, the sphere I showed you, that was the one at the very top. Um, it's um, number 5.1. Have you determined senior leadership accountability for establishing DNI principles and strategic objectives, including the provision of resources to achieve them and embedding DNI principles into the organisational culture? And there are, um, there's obviously there's level one, which is a, as a, um, a, a zero level. Um, but maturity levels, are you reactive? Yes, our process, however, um, but our process is um, reactive. So we are doing things, but it's not something that we are planning to do. We have a proactive um, process, um, but it's not under control. And we have a measurable process that is under regular critique. So those three levels of development that you've established in your organisation. And of course, in some instances, you may have no activity because it's not particularly relevant to your organisation. You may choose not to turn the tape, the full ISO in any one year, and you may be choosing to prioritise specific activities, in which case you won't look, look at it and you'll just score yourselves a zero in that. But you've done it with intention. And that's what's really important about all of this. So if we dive down a little bit further into the, the governance um, level. Um, we've got this about the senior leadership accountability. And in the tool, you're simply able to score yourselves at the three levels of maturity. And then in that column in the middle, I don't know if my mouse will um, shows here, it will give you, oops, give you an average for your score, which will then appear on your um, radar diagram. Um, under 5.1, there's another um, uh, level of, of um, progress. Are you demonstrating and role modelling behaviours that are required by the DNI principles, shared values and beliefs? And um, what do you hear? Have you got, um, we're doing something, but it's just reactive to something that somebody asks or challenges us on? Um, are you proactive, but it's not measured, so it's not under control? Or is it measurable and under regular critique? So we really have a handle on our intentional activity or strategy or process, um, but we are reviewing it and adjusting it as we go forward. Are you challenging behaviour that is inconsistent with diversity and inclusion principles and ensuring that people who challenge inappropriate behaviour and those that are affected by it are protected and supported? So these aren't one stroke kind of uh, if you are doing a survey of progress, and I did work on a development of a tool for professional societies as part of a National Science Foundation project in the United States over the last few years. Um, the social scientists on our advisory board were not liking these multiple um, items within a question. And so it was a really interesting conversation about um, having these multiple layers. And I think it's really important because it allows us to be saying really through move through the maturity. We might be doing one of the things in there, but we're not doing all of them and we're not measuring and reviewing them. So let's dig. These are the screen snips, so um, I can't um, make it uh, any bigger, but I think you can when you get the slides, you'll be able to zoom them in. So I apologise for that. So this takes you down to the uh, into the um, human resource life cycle piece of the um, risk category. But also this one in particular looks at the subcategory of learning and development. So I've got four example statements in here for you. Um, one of them is the um, learning development and those three other ones are from performance management. Um, and a wonderful um, domain of, of uh, frustration and, and sense people feeling crit criticised within organisations and feeling left out. Um, so again, you can read through, I won't read all of them out to you, but as an illustration on performance management, does your team ensure that the d &I principles and strategic objectives are included in performance management objectives and that the focus is on the job performance attributes rather than group characteristics? And so you again, you're able to um, give yourself the value here. So the spreadsheet goes across with further details. And there's also illustrations within inclusion score that gives you examples of the things that you can do and examples of policies and procedures that you can then use and adopt. And check that you've got your language right 
in terms of having that maturity as you go through it. And so again, you would give yourself that score between um, choose where you are on that and, and then it would then be aggregated for the risk category. But you can also get your radar diagram just for subcategories. So if you've got a team of people who've been assigned to look at that risk category or the subcategory, you're able to help them look at the progress that they are making and then they can report that and it aggregates it back so you have a high level uh, reporting to your EDI committee advisory group and hopefully your board as well. But it also gives you that useful document to then present to your insurer at the end of the uh, end of the year when you're going for renewal saying you know this, uh, this is where we have an exposure um, but we are working on it and we're looking at how we can manage those risks. Um, so I'm just going to scoot on to the next slide. Uh, hopefully those of you who are interested, you could do yourself a screenshot, but you will be getting the slides. Um, what are you doing in terms of um, what's the risk? This is the risk category of inclusive culture. And here are a few example statements um, from, from this um, this, this category. So just picking out one, I'm just going for the randomly for the um, third level down. Does your, so 7.2.3, does your team communicate behavioural expectations that promote the importance of inclusive, respectful behaviour and prevention of harassment, microaggression and any form of retaliation? So in this example here, um, they score themselves as a two, um, which is still saying that we have a um, we've got a reactive um, process in place. So it's, um, we're doing something, but we are um, not doing nothing. So this is improvement over actually doing nothing on everything. So I'm going to take you down to um, the next level so that you can have a look at organisational leadership as distinct from governance. Um, so risk category of leadership. Um, and so this, I've done a snip of um, four statements here, 2.1 down through to 2.4, and um, and it's mapped across to the statements within the ISO. So there's always that direct correlation. So if you've been do doing it yourself using the ISO download, um, you're able always to then retrofit it and put it back into this online platform. And overall, you can see that the um, inclusion score given to these four um, four for risk categories is uh, 2.29 based on um, the average of the score um, across the um, that category. And again, we'll see that in a radar diagram coming up shortly. So in terms of organisational leadership, um, some of the things that I know that because I know some of the names of people that are registered, you're really going to be going, yes, of course, yes, of course. And I'm hopeful you all, if those of you aren't familiar with the, uh, the standard, you'll be going, of course, yes, that's great to see that in there. It's about having principles and strategic objectives at a really high um, level, but it's around allocating the right resources. A lot of programmes fail, as we know, because they're under-resourced either with fun funding or personnel or expertise and um, so having the right resource obviously means you're going to have greater success um, and so this organization are you on this particular line i7 are you which is um, uh, 2.3 as well are you facilitating a positive organizational culture by establishing dni expectations and accountability um, communicating these to all stakeholders not just internal, all stakeholders, and fostering inclusive relationships and shared values with an increasingly diverse workforce, consumer base and supply chains. Oh, I meant to read that out, the one above. Sorry, I meant to read the one that's scoring four, where we've got a measurable um, process that's under regular critique. And you could start thinking about the kinds of activities that an organisation that would be moving the one I did read out into that level four where you've got this really rich and deep program of activities going out, you know, securing um, procurement from a diverse supply chain, um, just as, as an illustration. OK, so um, how does it then look in terms of measuring progress? So here is a, an example output of the compliance radar of actions and measures. Um, and so obviously, um, when we dive down, we can um, go down into 
um, all the different elements of this. Uh, you may choose to do a review of your um, in, get your inclusion score on a quarterly basis as you're updating things, depending on the requirement for your internal reporting. You may do it once a year and um, you may also choose to have your um, progress audited by inclusion score as an organisation. And obviously that would be something that would require much more connection and, um, and services from, from inclusion school. So but what you're able to do here is to show the radar plot of progress. So we're looking here at outcomes. And um, so I, I've thrown quite a lot of information at you. Um, and so I'm interested in those talking around, those of you perhaps who are already using the standard within your organisation, um, and do you have any other questions around this? Um, and do you think it's a useful approach? So, um, so if you're further curious, then I can organise to schedule a demo of the platform to have a look at. Um, you can try it for yourself. So there is the URL to go and register and have a, a try and a play, see what the standard looks like and how you might answer it. But also you might be using the ISO and might be interested in helping get a helping hand in terms of getting um, your, your team um, more conversant with the language and, and having some insights into the documentation that you could access through the resources that are available on the inclusion line, um, inclusion score platform. So um, throwing lots of things at you. Um, so thank you very much for your time and for listening.